First of all, that this finds you all safe, sound, and not having too many withdrawal symptoms from not being able to get waterside. Uh, certainly, I live by the side of a canal, so I'm waterside but can't actually get out there to fish it. When I was asked to do this lockdown video, um, I thought I needed to give you something to look forward to. For me, I look forward to June the 16th and the opening day of the river season so much. If I dream about it, I can't sleep without it. And it's a very special day, it always has been. So for me, the summer means early sunrises, late sunsets, and lots of chub fishing on crankbaits in between. Chub on cranks is probably one of the most exciting forms of lure fishing that you will find. From surface smash takes, to arm wrenching hits on the retrieve, a really down and dirty fight from the fish afterwards, it never knows when to give up. And trust me, it always saves one last run just underneath your feet. If you add on to that a little bit of surface sight fishing, stalking, I think you have an all round package. Uh, for me, I start on June the 16th and I won't finish probably until the end of September, perhaps into October if the weather is correct and the fishing is still good. Um, hopefully that will have got your interest, um, made your fish fishing juices uh, start to run. Um, so let's look at what tackle we need. Okay, let's look at what tackle we need. I'll start with the rods. Um, personally, I use two for most of my chubbing. Um, one is rated three to 14 grams as a casting weight. One is weighted, rated five to 21 grams. Most of my weights, the weights of my lures is gonna be between say five, six, seven, eight grams. Um, so they certainly cast the, the weight of lures that I'm using. I use a slightly heavier one. Um, for lower down the Thames when I'm casting farther, when I need to control the lure at greater distance and also play a fish at greater distance and stop it getting into those far bank snags and tree roots. Um, so that's when I use a heavier one. Um, the lighter one, I live just a mile and a half from the River Ray, um, which has got some big chub, but it's only two meters wide and it is pretty much jungle warfare. So I use that and it gives you a little bit of finesse. I'm using smaller lures there. Um, and that certainly does that job and it does down into the upper Thames. Both of them have got a very fast action, um, which I find ideal for really crisp, accurate casting. It also gives me a fast action to set the hook quickly. Both again have sensitive tips. So the tips are a little bit sensitive. I can feel that lure working as I bring it back across the river. Although chub are a very aggressive feeder, in most instances, we all get those days when perhaps they're not quite as aggressive as you would normally expect. And the number of fish that I get during the course of the season, that you just feel that little tap and you think there's a fish there, you keep working it, you keep working it, you keep working it. And as the lure comes under your feet, you get the take and the fish turns under your feet. That's really exciting. So that's the rods. Lengthwise, somewhere in the region of 2.1 meters, just a bit seven foot. It gives you enough that when you've got the fish close to your feet, you can keep it out in the, under the bank snags and reed beds. Um, and it gives you enough that you can get a decent casting across and control the lure when you need to, especially if it's windy. So 2.1, two different weight settings that 
handles all of my chub fishing at this present moment in time. Reel wise, any thousand, two and a half thousand reel, something that balances up with the rod. Um, on this one, there you go, that is perfectly balanced. I can use that all day without even knowing I've got it in my hand basically. So that's my lighter rod with a thousand size. The other one's got a two and a half thousand size reel on it. Braid, I use eight strand, 10 to 12 pound for my chubbing. Um, that is more than adequate. The only thing that you need on the reel is a smooth drag, because trust me, during the course of the, the, uh, the day or course of the season, it, that will be tested a few times, I can assure you, especially under your own feet. So you've got 10 to 12 pound braid on your reels. That comes up and finishes off with around a meter of fluorocarbon. I use between five pound and eight pound, depending on the size of fish that I know are in, in that stretch, the amount of snags that I'm casting to in that stretch, and obviously the size of lure just to give you the best presentation possible. Um, one of the questions that I was asked when I put a little thing up on Facebook saying I was doing this was, do I use a wire trace? And the answer to that is no. Um, it's quite simply, pike, I do not find as a problem. I'm casting into tight, far bank snags. I'm fishing the very upper levels of water. I don't expect to catch pike. I do expect to catch chub, I should say. Um, that really works well for me. I've never had any problems with bite-offs. Um, and I've had a few jacks during the course of the season come up under my own feet and suddenly inhale the lure, but 99.999 times the time, percent of the time, they either don't hook up or they hook up and I net them. So I don't use a wire trace. Um, not tried it yet, but something I'm going to mention, um, with the addition of Luz to the uh, Fox range, shall we say, um, got to try a bait caster for him. Gonna have so many advantages, I think. Um, I'm gonna link this pro tie. I'd probably load it with, I'm gonna start off trying to load it with eight pound fluorocarbon, see what that works like. Uh, matched up to a suitable bait casting rod, similar sort of specification to what I've already said for my spinning rods. Um, I think that will be absolutely superb. But quite often when you're fishing during the course of the session, when those fish are coming up to the lure, it is almost instantaneous. They come to the plop. So the lure goes plop, the fish goes smack. If you're using a spinning reel and you've not got your bail arm over in time, you've missed the fish. So with that, it's instantaneous. As soon as that hit, lure hits the water, click, you're engaged, bang, you're into the fish. I think it will have a lot of advantages. Um, I'm certainly going to try it during the course of the summer. Uh, what else do we need? Whatever bag you use normally. Don't forget a nice light and hooking mat. Landing net, I will mention for the rivers, you want something with sort of three meters of length because you quite often you'll be fishing on a high bank. You've got rushes and snags out on the inside. You need to be able to easily push that landing net handle out and get the net and net the fish really quickly. Um, obviously, small pan net or medium pan net actually. Um, rubberized of course so that the hook comes out nice and easily. You're ready to go. Next up, what we need, something that excites you all, lures. Okay, let's talk lures or the real business end of, the, of our tackle. Um, before Selmo came along, my go-to was most definitely the Fox Funk Buck. Um, brilliant little lure, caught me so many fish. However, when Selmo came into the equation, um, it opened up 
tremendous possibilities and so many more variations and opportunities to present in different ways. Um, I'm not going to get too complicated on this piece, uh, but I'll run through the various types of lures that I use during the course of the season or during the course of the session. My number one go-to, without a doubt, Rattling Hornet. Rattling Hornet in 4.5. Works straight out of the pack, absolutely brilliantly. Sits quite low in the water as a floating version. Runs nice and shallow. Um, and got such a nice little tight action on it. It's got the Salmo long cast system to it so it can cast really accurately and tightly into those far bank snags. And believe me, you do need to go tight and we'll run that into that sort of thing when I explain the different techniques that I use later on. So my number one go-to is a Rattling Horner and that's for fishing upper Thames, down into the lower Thames, weighs in at six grams. So it does cast really well with the long casting system and it does cast very accurately. So Rattling Horner, 4.5. I also carry it in the 3.5. Um, I use this on some of the small tributaries that I've said, the Thames, the little backwaters and such like, that we know hold big chub. So 3.5 comes into use for those. A little bit lighter, won't cast as far, so we're using it in smaller waters. So float inversion, Rattling Horner. Number two, it's got to be the little bug. And the little bug is just what it says. Um, floating version, obviously, sits up on the top. You can cast it into those wire bank snags. Let it just rest there. Let it drift down in the current. Let it get in underneath those tree branches. Give it a little pop and a twist and the chub come up and absolutely smash it. It's got a great little lip on the front so you can work it back across the top really nice and tightly. Fantastic lure. Um, really is so much so much fun to fish those. Um, this is one that was a fish catcher for me last year. It's called a tiny. Um, last year was not the best of years for, for chub fishing on the upper Thames, I don't think. Um, but on the occasions when you could see them up on the top, you may be able to get round to stalk one and put a little tiny in front of it and just twitch it back. Some of the fish that we caught on them, fantastic. Great, great little lure. It's only, yeah, it is, as it says, tiny. Um, obviously I use that up on the upper Thames and on the River Ray, which I've also mentioned. So any of the little small streams that you've got that you can fish that no old chub, the little backwaters that come off of the rivers around you, that again you know hold chub, the ones where you can see the fish and think, ah, what will they take? Stick that in front of their nose and give it a twitch and they'll turn around. I will say here, quite often I'll stick it on their tail, especially if there's three or four fish there, I'll always stick it on the tail of the biggest fish and that fish will very often just turn, push the others out of the way and take the lure. So, tiny, fantastic lure. Um, bullhead, again, great little lure. This is a lure I use when I want to retrieve, so I may be fishing over shallow gravels. Um, I cast down below the gravels and bring it back up along the side of them. You can see perhaps where the chub are hanging and you bring it along across in front of their nose. That works really, really well. Um, as does the minnow, which, as it says, great little lure. Um, a lure that I used last year uh, for the first time called a Fanatic. It's got a very shallow running nose to it. It's jointed. It's got a really tight action. It runs very shallow. Over weedy, snaggy swims, this can be deadly. A um, little bit bigger than the standard lures I'm using. Um, slim profile. It works so well. 
um, you can retrieve it really quickly. So if the fish are inclined to chase, you can really bring that back and in, in, incite the take, if you like. Um, so that's another one that I've put into my armory. Um, loved using it last year, caught a lot of fish with it. That really is about it. It's quite a tight range. I mean, I've got lots of others that I've acquired over the years, if you like. Um, but if I had to go to one, I would use a 4.5 centimetre rattling horner. Now, some of you may have noticed that I've got some with a black marker on the nose. And these are actually the smaller hornets in the sinking version. Um, it's also relevant on a minnow and on a bullhead. Um, I mark the noses on them, although Salmo are really good, they mark it as floating or sinking. Um, when they're in my box, I just want to be able to pick out a sinking lure really quickly. So I've marked all the, the front of the veins on my sinking lures with a black felt tip. And it means when they're sat in a box amongst all the air, Although I try to keep all my sinking lures at the front and my floaters to the back, as you can imagine during the course of a session, over several sessions, they all get mixed up. That just means that I can go pick out a sinker if I want it and use it straight away. The actual reasons for picking out that sinker, I will go into in the next stage, which is when we're actually fishing. Um, so what should be the really exciting bit. Um, hopefully, you will have seen what I use. All of these around a similar sort of weight, uh, weight uh, lure, all around the sort of six, five, seven grams. Um, heavy enough to cast exactly where you want it to, especially with the long cast system. The rattling horn it casts really accurately. Um, these you can put into where you want them. And like I say, brilliant lures, little tiny. You're not using it to cast fire. Quite often I'm fishing on my couple of sessions I did last year where I've cracked up onto a bridge and I can see four or five chub just sat in behind one of the stanchions. Um, I've crept around, I've strategically placed my landing net on the far side of the bridge. I've crept back up over the top and I've dropped a tiny in right on the nose of the biggest fish or in the tail of the biggest fish and just got it to turn just twitched it around, got it to turn and take, hooked it up, then slowly walked off the bridge, got around the side, and netted it off the side. Quite often by doing that, I've actually been able to go back and get a second fish out of that shoal that's still sat there. Um, last year, I didn't tend to take more than one or two fish out of any shoal. Um, they just weren't really settled or didn't seem to be. So I took one or two out of each shoal each shoal and moved on down the river. Uh, that way I knew when I went back the next time, I still had a chance of getting one or two. Um, and that is about it. So next comes actual fishing. Okay, so now we're down to the actual fishing part, um, which normally would be the exciting part. Uh, unfortunately, due to current conditions, we can't go on the riverbank. So I'll try to create as much excitement as I can, and I'll try to give you as much information as I can. So what do I look for when I'm looking for chub fishing? I probably look for the snaggiest swims that I can see. So I'll work my way down the river, and I look for the far bank bushes that are hanging right out those tree roots that are coming out, the dead trees that have fallen in the water and form cover. Chub love to lie underneath and behind cover. So I'm making my way down the river. Um, something I didn't mention earlier on, Polaroids. Absolutely essential for chub fishing. A lot of it is sight fishing, even if you're looking across that far side. Is that a fish? Isn't it a fish? Actually, you know what? I can see two or three fish there. If you can see two or three, the chances are there'll be another four or five underneath that you can't see. So a pair of Polaroids, very, very, very important, essential. So I'll work my way down the river and I'll look for those far bank hidey holes for the chub. 
um, somewhere that I can pin a lure really in tight, and I mean tight. Um, if you're not losing a lure or two during the course of a session or a couple of sessions, you're not going tight enough. Trust me, you're not. So you really are going in dead tight. Um, when I'm guiding, it's probably my worst nightmare because I'm telling people to actually, in some cases, lose a lure. <laughs> so you're going in tight, casting upstream, downstream, straight in front of you. It varies where, you're, where you can get to look at that swim. Um, ideally, I'd like to be able to cast just slightly upstream, let the lure work its way down to where I want it to be before I give it an a some action. Um, again, depending on what lure I've got on, if I've got the hornet that I'm going to try to bring back, then that's really good for doing that, as is the, the little bug, because you're casting it up, you're casting it in, you're letting it work its way down, it's floating down, it gets underneath those branches and you just go twitch, 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 and hopefully it goes clump as if a chub comes up and takes it. So it's a variation. I prefer to cast slightly upstream if I can. I don't mind casting directly in front of me and getting it in under tight. And if I need to, because I can't get access farther down, I will cast down and then let the lure come round and work it back up. Um, all of them work and all of them catch fish. Uh, you've got to look for those snags, you've got to look for those trees and bushes. Um, an ideal chub swim, for me, anyhow, going through the course of the season, is a chub swim with bushes right out over it, and either a reed and rush bed above or below. Um, those are marked off in my memory um, really sharply, because as we go through the season, um, those chub will quite often move out from underneath that, those bushes and sit really tight to those rushes or reed bed because as the insects go through their normal life cycle um, you'll get them landing onto the rushes and the reeds they die, they fall off and the chub will lie there and just feed on, you know, here comes some more I'll have some of that so that's a great chub swim it's good you can fish it throughout the summer if you like so as we get into the autumn stages, then I'll go there and I'll be casting tight into those rushes, really tight. So again, reed bed, rush beds, chub hold up on those, they sit in nice and tight underneath. And again, as you get to know your river and you spot them in different places, you'll gradually work out. Not every bush holds chub. So when you first start on a stretch, you'll fish every bush and five out of six won't hold chub perhaps. So the sixth one that does old chub, mark it down, that's the one to go to. Work your way on down the river. So that's how I start off when I, I'm on a new stretch. Um, never ignore your own bank. So everybody's always cast into the far bank, but I catch a lot of chub under my own bank. Because what would I do if I was on the far bank and I saw a bush? I'd be saying, yeah, I'm going to cast across to it. So. Never ignore your own bank, be very careful. You can actually work these near back swims really well because you can cast across and down, let your lure swing around and you can bring that lure right up underneath that bush, really right tight up underneath it and that's when you get the take underneath. So never ignore your own bank. Again, if you've got rush, a reed bed or a rush bed down the inside, it's always worthwhile giving it a couple of chucks down there and bring it back up works really, really well. So you've got your swim, you're working it, you've, you've gone in tight. When that lure hits, the reason that Chub has sat underneath those bushes and sat next to reed beds and rushes, I've already said, is because they're expecting at some stage either food to be passing by them or for food to be falling off the branches above. So whether it's a caterpillar, whether it's a slug coming off, falling in, they go in and the fish come to the plop, as I've already said. That, I think, is why perhaps the rattling hornet and the little bug work so well, because they're going in, you can cast them in with a plop, perhaps a higher trajectory than you would normally do, if you can get it in there tight, 
goes in with a plop and it's instantaneous, bang. The fish comes straight to it. Great way of fishing. When they're taking it like that, really is exciting. So that is the way I work down the, down the, the river. One thing I haven't mentioned yet, um, which is important, it's very important, is colour. So lures come in all shapes and sizes, all different colours. Some people have one colour as a favourite, some people have another. For me, it is all about contrast. So if I'm casting in tight under that far bank, and the fish is looking up, if I've got a dark coloured lure, you'll lose it in amongst the branches. It doesn't stand out. If I've got a light coloured lure sat up on the top, it stands out. So <clears throat> I use a light coloured lure when I'm casting in tight. I use a dark colour bellied lure when I'm fishing perhaps to a reed bed and bringing it back up, or I'm fishing over gravels. So Really, I suppose, in terms of reality, black and white would probably do it, but um, it wouldn't look so pretty, would it? So I use quite often natural colours, silvers, bait fish imitations um, for fishing tight across, and I use something with a different colour with a darker belly to fish in when I'm fishing for reed beds and I'm bringing it back up over gravels or whatever. So. That sort of explains the colour that I use. Um, some of the ones that I've got in my box, which will give me a really good profile. You know, that will give you a good profile. It's a really dark colour. Um, so you've got combinations. It's what works for you. That's what works for me. Dark colours, dark colours when I'm fishing rush, rushes, when I'm fishing out into open water. Lighter colours when I'm fishing tight into shadows and right in underneath bushes. So that really gives you a good starter for 10. Okay, so early season, some of the other places to look at, below weir pools where you've got the deep pool coming up onto quite often a shallow gravel bar. Where the the chub come there to spawn, they stay there to clean off and if there's a good food source in terms of minnow or gudgeon, they stay there for quite some while. When that is the case, pull in something like a, a minnow pass and really quickly works really well. Um, that or a bullhead, pull pass them. Um, or perhaps one of my other favourites, a frisky, which is stay nice and slow, underneath, nice and shallow underneath the surface and work back there. So you can work on down from there. We've mentioned all of the chub spots like bushes and reed beds. Moored boats. If there are boats that boats seem to sit alongside the rivers for all summer without being moved, some of them. Um, if it's a boat that's not been moved for a while, then certainly it's a worth a cast or two underneath it. Quite often I'll put a sinking lure underneath it let it sink, cast to the bow, let it sink underneath, drop back underneath there, give it a few twitches and very often you'll get an extra fish or two. So we've looked at weir pools, we've looked at bushes, we've mentioned bridges earlier on and obviously the stanchions behind the bridge, quite often the chub will sit in there behind those bridge stanchions, move out when food is coming past and move back out of the current and just stay there nice and stationary. Um, you can either cast to them, or if it's a bridge where you can get up over the top, some of the little wooden foot bridges, you can get up over the top, you can see the fish and you can drop a tiny or a little buggy on top of them and catch them that way. So bridges, boats, bushes, reed beds, anywhere where there's extra cover is absolutely spot on. Now some of you will have noticed that some of my lures have just a single hook on them um, for several reasons really. Um, this is a rattling hornet with a single. I prefer to connect up with a micro snap and I can use whichever hook I like, whether it's a wide gate drop shot, 
a kayak pork or whatever. Um, I do this for a number of reasons. One, if it is a misplaced cast into the firebank bush, a single hook would very often come out a lot easier than two trebles. So a single hook comes back out, if it goes in, I normally try to flip it, one flip, and it, if it's going to come out, it comes out straight away. The other thing is, a chub very often they will come up behind, see that it's not actually what they thought it was, and turn off. With that trailing hook, 99% of the time you catch them in the scissor, and they just turn away, and you've got them hooked, no strike at all. Uh, the other way is if it's a, class, a cast in and a plop, and the fish comes up from below and turns off short, it also hooks it into the scissor. So that works really well for that purpose. Um, it also leaves the ring for the front treble free. And on some of these lures, just by adding an AA shot to them and pinching it up tight, you can make that floater into a slow suspender. You've had one or two chub out of the swim perhaps and they've disappeared what's happened is they drop back underneath those bushes. If you put a suspender in underneath and let it drop back and give it a couple of twitches, very often you will get an extra fish or two. So it also works on the little bug. As you can imagine, they come up below. Well, that's not edible. Turn off and you're hooked. So that's why I do it. I don't do it on all my lures because a lot of these a lot of these rattling hornets I will use for perch at some stage of the season. So I just convert a number of my lures just purely for chubbing. Um, that's about it. A uh, couple of other questions and answers. One of the things that's coming out in the summer is a rattling hornet in 3.5 and 4.5 with that lip on the front. That is going to be brilliant. It's going to make a great lure into an even better lure because it will run in the 4.5 version up to 0.7 meters deep and in the 3.5 version up to 0.5 meters deep. So it means that we'll be able to give a really fast retrieve if need be to make one chase, but it's not going to go down and dive and snag on the weed or whatever. So that's going to be a big improvement. Can't wait to see them. Um, the other thing is I was asked a question, do I use micro snaps? Personally, I don't. Um, neither is right or wrong. I would sooner add 30 centimetres to my leader and be able to knock back three or four times um, and direct to the lure. It's how I fish. I'm not saying it's right. I'm not saying it's wrong. If you prefer to use a micro snap, then feel free to do so. Um, I'm not in competition mode, uh, so a couple of seconds mean nothing to me one way or the other. I'm there to enjoy myself. So that's about it really. Um, hopefully I can get Sam down in the summer from Fox and we can go out and film and actually catch some chub um, and you can see what I've been saying in action. So that's the plan. Um, but for now, stay at home, stay safe and uh, I'll see you on the riverbank later on in the year.